and I'm really happy to be here, even if it's a really short visit, so unfortunately I won't be able to stay for the rest of the, the meeting. I arrived yesterday and I leave today, which is quite cool. So let me tell you a little bit about my project by starting to tell you about our research, because you know I do research in the field of user innovation, which means that we care about the role of users in developing new products and services. And you know, users like you and me, that are often not involved in the R&D of new products and services, often innovate. I mean, we do things like the ones that are listed here, from the World Wide Web to many financial services to the mountain bike, to the sports bra, a lot of different things. And, you know, we have studied those examples for a long time. For instance, we know that Mr. Ford was very important because he developed, you know, Ford Motor Company. He was able to actually mass produce cars, which means, you know, he produced a lot of cars for a reasonable price so that lots of people like you and me could afford it. Um, the cool thing about it is that some users were not happy with the car that they were getting from Mr. Ford, so they started to innovate. You know, the first user in the northern part of Michigan that realized that the car under a lot of snow doesn't really help, he started modifying the car and did the first snowmobile. Other farmers did tractors and trucks. Some of these models actually, actually never succeeded, right? You probably never saw a moving chapel out there. But it's cool that some users were unhappy with the product that they were getting from the producer and start modifying it. I mean, and we have studied this for a long time, the role of users in developing new products and services. For instance, in radical sports, we knew that a lot of things were done by users from the very beginning. Sometimes users invent new sports. Uh, some examples from, you know, kayaking, right? You would imagine, you could easily imagine that an engineer that knew a lot about, about hydrodynamics could have developed this kayak over here, but then, over the time, some users that were not completely satisfied with this model start modifying it and the different versions of it. I mean, and we saw this, you know, over and over again in different sports. Then we start realizing that sometimes, actually, because the need is the mother of inventions, if we go to places of high need, you'll get even more innovation. For instance, we start seeing a lot of south-north diffusion, which means people in developing countries often innovate. They sometimes develop entirely new industries. Mobile banking, I mean, one of the uh, uh, most important places for the development of mobile banking was the Philippines, uh, because of the high need that we could find over there. Well, but you know, I'm here to talk about healthcare. And I'm just starting with this introduction because for a long time, nobody thought that users in healthcare, in particular patients, could innovate. When we start looking at healthcare, we were really impressed with the amount of treatments, therapies, and medical devices that were actually developed by patients. Often patients of chronic diseases, sometimes fatal diseases, actually developed very important technologies, very important solutions. Let me give you a few examples. Let me introduce you to, Mil, to Mr. Tail Goldsworthy. You know, this gentleman here was going to die. And that's not nice, right? I mean, knowing that one is going to die is not good news. But if we believe that need is the mother of inventions, on the other side, it's a very strong incentive to do something about it. This was around 2002 when he went to the doctor and the doctor told him, you know, your aorta could explode at any moment, which is sad, but you may die, right? He went home of course, unhappy with the news, and he realized that he would like to study his own problem. He, was, he is an engineer, so he knows a little bit about pump, plumbing and pumping, and he realized, well, you know, my award uh, is something that I possibly can fix. And he did that. He did the thing that you see over there. It's a, an aortic support that later on he develops exactly what you see over there, and he walked back into his doctor's office and asked him, you know, would you mind putting this thing in? Because I think this can save my life, but I cannot do it by myself. So don't try this at home, it's quite complex. But you know, he, he did it, and he did it in 2004, so we actually got the uh, 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 aortic support in 2004, and he's still alive, he was with us two weeks ago, uh, you know, this was 10 years ago, and the good news is that he got the 
support, many people got the support, about 45 people got the support, so he saved his own life and saved the lives of many people. And, you know, we start finding all these examples, people from different diseases that have developed very interesting solutions, like, you know, this high-functioning autist that developed so-called squeezing machine. Because we often see kids and adults that suffer from autism being hugged, and, of course, in a hug, there's a lot of emotion sometimes, right? But apart from that, what these people need is some pressure. And the pressure gives them a lot of comfort, but on the other side, they are overly sensitive to human touch. So this makes it very complicated, because a lot of pressure irritates people. Not enough pressure doesn't do anything. So it only totally makes sense that some users actually develop the machine that now they can control so that they get the amount of pressure that they want. You know, and we start bumping into examples like this. Mr. Amit Gofer from Israel, he got paralyzed in a car accident. Not just, you know, he got quadriplegic or tetraplegic, but he developed a solution for himself. And he developed the most sophisticated electronic trousers that you'll see out there that allow him to walk. Again, you know, these are all examples of patients. And if you think about it, that's not typically the source of innovation that comes to mind when we think about healthcare. Let me provide you a few more examples to tell you how much we resist to healthcare innovation. I mean, Mr. Erbkern is an engineer. I hope he's still with us because he's now 104 years old. Uh, last time I talk, talked with him, he was 102, so yeah, uh, uh, he should be still with us. But not just that, he, 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 for 15 years, he collected data about his depressions. He realized at some point in his life that he would get depressed from time to time. And because he, he's an engineer, he worked for AT&T, he started you know, collecting data about the days in which he was depressed. And he started analyzing the patterns, and he realized that he was depressed in those days in which he wasn't getting sunlight. Well, you know, the bad news is that he could not turn the sun the good news is that he could experiment with different solutions. And he did that. So he, he started experimenting with artificial light, putting the lights in front of his body to see to what extent this would help him. So this gentleman not only realized that there is a new disease out there, which is called seasonal affective disorder, but also found the solution for the disease, which is the so-called light therapy that today is accepted by doctors and by everyone. You know, he was so happy with his findings that he prepared a report, well, a report with 15 years of data, right? And he sent it to the National Institute of Mental Health in Washington. And he thought, you know, these guys, because they have thousands of PhDs that are doing research in depression and related problems, they will be all excited with my news. Guess what? Nobody replied, right? A year later, he insisted. So, you know, look at this data, please, because this is quite cool. This is relevant. Lots of people suffer from this, I believe. Again, nobody replies. With the help of his local doctor, he actually got in touch with another guy at the National Institute of, Health, uh, of Mental Health, a guy called Norm Rosenthal, who was the only person that got interested in Erbskern case. And it's very interesting because not just that, he actually became very famous because he was the one that gave it the name. Seasonal Affective Disorder was a name given by Dr. Norm Rosenthal, the only doctor that got interested in this case. And you know what? What's very interesting about this doctor is that he's a patient himself. You know, he, he wrote two books about this in which he says, in, he's very open and honest, he says in the first chapter, you know, I suffer from this disease. The name of the chapter is My SAD, My Seasonal Affective Disorder Story, because he had moved from South Africa to Minnesota, and guess what? The amount of sunlight is not comparable, so he was getting depressed. You know, making a long story short, again, a user, in this case a patient, invented the disease or discovered the disease, he found out the solution, and everyone resisted. Nobody believed, because we don't think of patients as sources of innovation. Patients like Mr. Richard Bernstein, at some point in his life, he realized that he could cure or he could find a way to better deal with his type 1 diabetes. Again, I'm not going to tell you a long story. I will tell you that he was, again, so happy that he decided that he was going to publish the results of his discoveries. Same story. Nobody believed him. 
He was so frustrated that at the age of 45, he realized that he was going to take a medical degree so that others actually believe him. He did that at the age of 45. When he finished, when he, finished he was already 50. And uh, uh, he finally published a book called uh, Dr. Bernstein, Diabetes Solution. He, he actually now insists on being called doctor for obvious reasons, right? Because nobody believed him when he was not one. But think about it. I mean, there are hundreds of examples out there of people that developed interesting solutions. These people are patients. These people suffer from chronic diseases. In some cases, they are going to die. And if they walk into a specialist's office, the doctor will tell him, you don't know enough about your disease. Which is interesting, right? Because, you know, living with a disease for the rest of your life sort of is enough to motivate you to study a lot. In fact, that's what some of our patients say, right? You know, the patients are the ones that have the knowledge in the topic of every day use of the device. So it actually makes sense. And when we start analyzing this, at some point people start saying, you know, what you are giving me are random examples across many diseases. I want a study that goes deep into one disease so that I can believe your results. And we did that. So we start analyzing cystic fibrosis. You know, it's a complex disease, it's a fatal disease, the life expectancy used to be five years, it's now 40. It's a very significant increase in life expectancy, 35 years. I mean, when you think about the solutions that are available out there, you'll be very surprised to find that most of them were developed by patients. So, just to tell you something about disease, one of the problems is that a lot of mucus accumulates in the lungs, and these people end up dying with lung infections. For this reason, they need to clean the lungs, you know, through specturation. Over the years, we found ways of cleaning the lungs. Most of the times, these methods were based on the so-called ketchup bottle principle, and you already anticipate that this involves lots of chest clapping, as we do with the ketchup bottle, to take the ketchup out, right? And uh, uh, we turn kids upside down, we do four hours of chest clapping, and finally they spectorate. You know, this is not very comfortable, some people say. You know, for instance, Louis Plant, he says, you can't even imagine how excruciating it is to do chest clapping when, for instance, your body hurts. Because at some point, he went through a lung uh, a transplant, he was getting a lot of fever, he was getting a lot of pain, and then he had to do four hours of chest clapping per day to live another day because this was the solution to actually clean the lungs. Well, the good news is that he solved the problem. One day he went to a concert, and he realized that's so interesting, because when the musicians are playing, I start coughing. And then they stop playing, and I stop coughing. And actually, it was embarrassing, because people were looking at him like, what's your problem, right? Why don't you now take the break and cough all that you have to cough? Uh, and he was surprised with this and actually upset because at some point the demand increased and he had this huge crisis of speculation and had to leave the concert. And he went home thinking about this because, you know, this was bad on one side, but it was good news on the other side because speculation is what they do to actually clean the lungs. So, you know, he went home and, th and thought, this is because I was sitting in front of the speakers and the vibrations were actually cleaning the lungs, were vibrating the lungs, therefore loosening the mucus, and through this I was getting my mucus out. Well, he, start, he started experimenting with speakers, he would put speakers in front of his lungs, and realized that, wow, it works, I can clean my lungs. And the next thing he did was to remove the sound, and you know, again, making a long story short, he developed the machine that you see over there. It was developed by a patient, is the frequencer, is what many people carry around when they need to clean the legs. You know, again, a patient doing the same. You know, Emily Eger, another patient who sadly died a few years ago, she actually developed another important solution for cystic fibrosis patients, the so-called saline water treatment, because she was a surfer. And, you know, she was actually surfing against uh, the advice of her doctor. But, you know, it worked very well for her. It worked very well for other people. And, you know, this repeats over and over again. In New Zealand, a doctor realized that some parents were always talking about how cool it is when the kids 
uh, uh, jump in trampolines because what the kids are doing is to vibrate everything, including the lungs, therefore losing the, look, the mucus that comes out through expectoration. Again, a very cool solution that now is medically recommended. Jump in trampolines, in particular if you are a kid. So, uh, you know, again, stories that never end. We found hundreds of examples before we even decided to open a platform. And then we realized, well, these are a lot of examples, but are only a few if we think, for instance, about rare diseases. Because rare diseases are individually rare, but when we put them all together, they are a big problem. And guess what? Pharmaceuticals couldn't care less, because there's no market. Some of these diseases have 20 people in my country. Of course, this doesn't justify an investment. We are talking about 7,000 diseases. So there's a huge potential to actually do something about this. And when we start surveying people, we first did a small survey of 500 people to understand the percentage of patients that had innovated, and we concluded that 13% of our sample had developed something cool over the period of the past three years for themselves. You know, and not just that, they were telling us that this has a very important impact on the quality of life of themselves as patients or of the caregivers. And, uh, you know, uh, for instance, if you measure this in a Likert scale, it jumps from 3.2 to 5.1 before and after the innovation for patients and from 3.3 to 5 for the caregivers. So this is really helping these people, right? So, I mean, we were finding a lot of cool things, lots of innovations, but at the same time, these innovations were not going anywhere because users don't have an incentive to diffuse, right? If I innovate, I do it with the objective of using, of course. I'm not going necessarily to diffuse it, to sell it. That's where we thought that we could do something about it. And we developed what we call patient innovation, which is an international, multilingual, free, it's a non-profit platform and social network to allow patients to actually share solutions that work for themselves. And when we did this in the very beginning, uh, uh, we were doing this just for research purposes. I mean, we are in academia. We sometimes put up platforms so that patients can, or, or users in general, can experiment and we see what people are doing. And when we start talking about this, we were really impressed because people in audiences like this one were so interested in our project. You know, the United Nations uh, at some point heard about our project and put this on their website saying that we are very excited about this project. And this was just going to be another research project. I was excited as well with the fact that they were excited, but I couldn't really understand, right? Because when I was previously talking about banking, user innovation in banking, nobody typically gets excited. So uh, this was cool because we put up the platform and then we start getting contacts of people that some of them we didn't know. Mr. Richard Roberts came to me at the end of one of these conferences and said, you know, this is probably one of the coolest projects I've ever heard about in the past couple of years. It's like, really? Wow, okay. Who the hell are you? And he said, by the way, my name is Richard Roberts and I got a Nobel Prize for medicine. Uh, uh, and I think I could help because I could do something. We could actually invite some of my Nobel friends and uh, we could create some committees to help you. Uh, we could create an advisory board. You know, at the time, I was just actually going to have a small platform for research purposes with a small sample of patients in Portugal, right? And this guy is offering his noble friends to create an advisory board because he believes that the project has a lot of potential. And I was like, I mean, Sure, if you think it's a good idea, you know, I can do that. So, you know, we start getting support from Nobel laureates. Eric Van Ippel is not the laureate yet, I think, but uh, he's a, a, a very influential person in this project. We have worked uh, in user innovation for a long time. He's actually the father of the entire field of user innovation. He's a professor at MIT. And then, you know, this is our board, uh, uh, several no laureates here, like Aaron Shishanover. Bob Langer is not yet, is an, another one of those guys that is not yet a Nobel laureate, but he owns uh, 1,030 patents, uh, which is probably more than some of us in this audience. Uh, I mean, nobody on earth has more patents than he does. Uh, uh, Bob Langer actually has more patents than Edison already. Edison was until recently the guy with more patents 
whatever. Uh, and, you know, these are some of other supporters, you know, o Joito from the Media Lab, uh, lots of people from academia, from different parts of the globe. And, uh, and this is our team. So what we did is this platform that we launched two months ago, uh, in which uh, we have now patients from all diseases uh, sharing knowledge, sharing solutions that work for themselves. And uh, um, by doing that, they help many other people. So if you can, you can visit us at uh, www.patient-innovation.com. Uh, soon we will start what we call the Patient Innovation Award, which is an award that is intended to raise awareness of the role of patients in uh, uh, developing new solutions that help them and help many other people. By doing that, we also hope to promote collaboration, collaboration like some of the things that we already saw, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Mr. Owen from uh, Washington, uh, in the Washington, uh, sorry, fr from the West, from the, from the West Coast in the United States, uh, who is a puppeteer, he prints stuff, he is a 3D printer as well. And he realized that at some point he got an email because of a fake end that he put online. Uh, he does puppets for theater. So at some point he did a, did a big end, an artificial end, and he put it on YouTube. And what happened next was that a carpenter from South Africa uh, that got you know, rid of fingers in an accident saw this end online and wrote him a message saying, you know, your end is too big for me, but sounds cheap, and I could have one of those. Would you mind doing one for me? Because I don't have the $40,000 that they asked me to get an artificial end, but I could use one of yours. And apparently that costs like $5 as opposed to $40,000. Uh, it's just the material to 3D print it. And Ivan Owen started 3D printing ends and start printing 3D printing fingers and all sorts of parts of the human body without ever being involved in healthcare. So Ivan Owen is, for instance, one of the persons that is now actively using our platform to help other people. Ivan has nothing to do with healthcare, but he's already helping a lot of people. You know, again, that's what we are trying to do by bringing people together in particular patients and caregivers that can directly help themselves and each other, but also people from other industries and maybe you can help too. Thank you.